The HRES, or Heartland Renewable Energy Society, is to further the development and use of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies, to promote those businesses on the cutting edge of renewable energy, and to educate the public businesses and our policymakers on the need to create a clean, safe, and renewable energy future. And we do this through our workshop, our website, our annual tours, and our special events. So here uh, at the bottom, you can see our email address and our URL, uh, heartlandrenewable.org. And we invite you to join Heartland Renewable. Uh, uh, and why would you wanna join it? Well, this is a very interesting time that we are in. We're at the beginning of uh, a social re revolution. For us who have been in this for a long, long time, it doesn't seem like the beginning, but when we look back a hundred years from now, it will seem like today was the beginning of a new uh, solar revolution. With the new administration, we don't know what to expect. And I imagine they're scratching their heads as well. But as we go through this, HRES will be tracking these changes with our workshops and our website and distill down our federal Kansas and Missouri information uh, and bring it to you in understandable terms. So stay tuned and join HRES. The format of today's presentation is that I will be doing some background information on passive solar and energy efficiency fundamentals. And then Ken will present more technical data on solar and solar PV or photovoltaics. And then we will have uh, some final questions at the end of our two presentations. And as we go through the presentations, if you have questions at the bottom of your screen, and you may have to mouse over it to see this, but uh, put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And then uh, uh, at, at, uh, at the end of our presentations, we will go through those and answer your questions. So, uh, and this uh, may or may not be totally accurate. I'm sure that uh, it's different for various states, but this shows a basic pro forma or, or pie chart of what uh, our uh, energy consumption is in our homes. Uh, and what type of uh, energy loss do we have? What are the sources of our energy loss? Well, the first is air infiltration. And air, air, air infiltration for those of us who have built houses is enemy number one. Air seepage due to the wind and air pressure that pushes cold air in through tiny openings or sometimes large openings on the windy side of the house and draws heated air out of the house on the opposite side of the house. Drafts occur through wallboard cracks, gaps around paneling, cutouts for pipes and wiring, poor sealing of windows and doors, uh, and uh, loose molding at the bottoms of the walls. So those are the main areas where air infiltration occurs. And if we look at this pie chart, we can see that uh, floors, walls, and ceilings are where most of our uh, losses come from. And then it's more or less evenly divided through windows, doors, plumbing penetration, and fireplaces, and ducts, that you get to fans and electrical outlets. So another type of heat loss is conduction losses. And conduction is the passage of heat through a material. Some materials like glass and metal conduct heat readily and lose it rapidly. Insulation helps to block the conduction or loss of heat through that wall material. If ceilings and walls are poorly insulated, they conduct heat from the house to the outside. Another type of heat loss is convection losses. And that's if you've got a cavity like a, a window uh, where you've got an airspace in between. Uh, as the, the, uh, on the cold side of that cavity, you have air falling because it's cold and then it rises on the warm side of that window cavity so that you get a, a thermal siphon going and that increases the heat loss in that window. Another type of heat loss is condensation. Condensation is beads of moisture that form on the surfaces of windows and moist air is cooled. And so moisture condensing from the room shows us 
that we've got a, a loss of heat in those cooled areas. The cures are double or even triple glazing of windows, heavy drapes, and insulated shades or sliding panels. Another type of heat loss is radiation. And radiation is the passage of energy through an open space like sunlight. So sunlight comes into the houses and absorbed by some surfaces more than others. And then it starts to re-radiate as the temperature in that area gets colder. And radiation is also a method of delivering heat that is used by builders, such as steam or water radiators, wood burning stoves are a source of radiation, heated slabs from the sun's energy, et cetera. So what are tools to save energy? Well, of course, there's insulation. And we all know that insulation is in our walls, hopefully in some older homes that was limited to wadded up newspaper. But commonly used materials are fiberglass, cellulose, rock wool, and styrofoam, sprayed or otherwise. The resistance to heat flow is provided by the many dead air spaces between the fibers or particles in the insulation. And it comes in blankets, bats, foam boards, small loose pieces, or is sprayed. Vapor uh, air infiltration barriers are uh, a waterproof liner that is, that is used to prevent the passage of moisture through a building structure. Vapor barriers in walls and ceilings should be located on the interior or warm side of a wall to prevent uh, moisture from uh, condensating and causing sometimes building problems with rot. Vapor barriers also make it difficult, if not impossible, for air leakage into the home, depending upon the installation. And also the smart use of caulk and foam goes a long way to stop air infiltration. So here is one example of a tool that is used. This is an attic fan cover. Uh, and on the back of that attic fan over here is a piano hinge. And then here and here are uh, toggle boats to undo that. And once those are undone, the attic fan cover uh, rolls down and we see a big two inch styrofoam cork that is placed in there with a foam gasket on the top. So that really goes a long way at this, in this particular attic fan installation toward um, stopping air infiltration. Now, back in the day when I was building, I built a lot of houses in the 80s. This was what I used, and we have a, a vapor barrier in between a two by two here and a two by four, which is behind that. And we would caulk every seam in that poly. And then through this channel, we would run our wiring and plumbing. And then we would follow up by adding another layer of insulation, a thinner layer, in that two by two cavity and cover that with poly, caulking all the seams of the poly. Uh, and then in, in the ceiling, we would also put our caulk and, and caulk uh, all the seams of the poly. So we're basically creating an airtight situation. Uh, this is a ceiling light outlet or, or box. And what we did was cut the poly a little bit smaller then the diameter of that, and then we would stretch it over top of that. And then we would caulk where the wire comes through and then around where uh, the poly meets in contact with the box. So, uh, and then we would also caulk where we have attic penetrations. This is a vent pipe that goes uh, up into the attic and out the roof. And we caulk the top and bottom of that. Now, fast forward to today, and this spray foam insulation does all the things that I used to do in kind of individually. We have our outlets um, and our windows, and all, all of this is miraculously and very effectively uh, providing the air infiltration barrier. So, what are the tools? that we use to save energy. Another tool is window treatments, and we will uh, see that later on in, in the presentation. And they are applications on the interior side. They can be blinds, shutters, draperies that are used to save energy and keep heat in or out. 
Uh, a damper is also used, which are a trap door or other device which controls the passage of air through a duct, chimney, or stove pipe. Flow restrictors are often used for water flow to, like in a shower, reduce the flow of water. And that saves energy by cutting down on the amount of hot water used. But when we're dealing with solar energy, the number one thing we have to know is where is the sun? And the sun moves around during the year. In the summertime, it rises north of due east, goes very low in the sky, and sets north of due west. It's also high in the sky up here at 12 o'clock noon. While in the wintertime, it rises uh, on the south of due east, goes very low in the sky, and sets south of due west. And so the summer will bake your home and raise your cooling load on the east and west if you've got a lot of unprotected windows there. So what we want to do is protect those windows. And one of the best ways uh, is to shade your house with trees, whether you're building or whether you're already there. You're, you can always begin to make your house more efficient by putting uh, trees on the east side and on the west side, especially on the west side, because now you're in the heat of the day and your house is already struggling to keep cool. South windows can also hurt your energy load, depending upon the design of the overhang. If we look at here, we see six months of the year uh, when the sun is coming through a south piece of glass. And these uh, six to two to one is a, is a ratio that I always tried to use. And you can see here that in the winter months that the sun, for the most part, is allowed to come into the window. But in the summertime, for July, August, and June, it is for the most part blocked and will not let the sun uh, heat up your house. And now we're gonna do a quick primer on passive solar. And so this is a, an example of a direct gain system. And I should start out by saying that when I was building, I would say there are three components to a good passive solar home. The most important is the shell of the house, make sure your, uh, the shell of the house does not lose energy, does not lose energy and does not allow the house to gain uh, heat when you don't want it to. But in a direct gain house, what that means is that the, all of the solar energy comes directly into a conditioned space or a space that is lived in. Uh, you can see here, there's something going on with the direction of the sun. That's because we used a diffused glass here in the, in the clear story, and then we use clear glass here, and, and that we'll, we'll see a picture of that later on. Another type of solar is an isolated gain solar. Uh, I should, I'm gonna back up one. And then we have the thermal mass here, uh, which is the, uh, we have the shell of a home, which is very important. We have the solar glazing, which is the ne next most important thing. And then the third uh, is the, thermal mass that collects the sun's energy and then radiates that heat out when the air around it cools. So this is the second type of solar system for passive solar and it's isolated gain. This is typically a sun space. The sun comes in and warms this, in this case, 16 inch mass wall. The heat uh, from that energy conducts over a period of time so that uh, in the evening, the, the morning sun is passed through and the afternoon sun meets, re reaches the other side later on in the night. And then it radiates that heat to the inside of the house. Then the third type is indirect gain. And with this, the solar glazing or glass is put in a uh, configuration where there is maybe a two to four inch airspace between the glass or glazing and the mass wall, and then that uh, energy goes through the mass wall. So here are some examples of passive solar homes and the components that I've just talked about. Now this is the home uh, that has that diffused glass at the top, and you can see it looks different than this. It doesn't reflect light the same way that this light uh, is reflected from these windows. Uh, and we'll see what that looks like on the inside. So the, these pieces of glazing here 
are part of the direct gain system. And this is a sun space, which we will see in a minute, uh, which lets the sun come in and hit a mass wall. So here's what that looks like on the inside. You can see that the light from the clear story, which was diffused, is uh, nice and soft. And then uh, we have a masonry floor here that um, uh, collects the sun's energy. And then over here, <clears throat> this is behind the isolated gain uh, glazing, and this is the 16-inch mass wall. The sun will come in and hit this mass wall, and over a period of eight or 10 hours, it will conduct or flow through that wall to reach the inside of the house where it provides radiant energy to the inhabitants on the conditioned spaces. This is another house this <clears throat> that is all direct gain. All these windows go into a space that is conditioned that are considered living space. And we have uh, earth contact on this side of the house and then around behind the back on both sides, we have uh, another area of earth contact. This is the inside of that home where we see uh, a terracotta thermal mass floor on a slab. And the, this is this back in the day was called window quilt, which, which was an excellent window insulation system. It rolled down on tracks on each side of the window and it turned an R2 window to about an R5.2 window. So it, it was effective both in the wintertime when you think of window insulation, but also in the summertime because there's lots of radiant energy that is trying to come through from the outside of the home to the inside of the home based upon uh, the sun and everything being warm on the outside. This is a home that I lived in for 45 or for 40 years that I just moved from Kansas City to uh, Loveland, Colorado. And it is a two-story greenhouse. And we'll see what that looks like here. This is on the inside where we have black brick to absorb the sun's energy. And then see this window right here? We're gonna see what that looks like on the other side of that window, which, get back there, uh, which is in the kitchen area. And it, uh, this is a solid stone and brick wall. When they built the wall, the, the uh, brick masons filled the cavity with mortar uh, as they built up their brick. So the stone went up first and then the, then the brick went up. So again, just to review, this is the indirect gain house, and we're going to see an example of an indirect gain house. So this has, has all three types of solar. These windows here are direct gain. This has a little sun space here with isolated gain. And then this area here is where we will put glazing on this 16-inch concrete wall to create an indirect gain system. So we next stucco that area uh, with uh, a, a white material that covers up the imperfections of the um, concrete wall. And then we paint that black. And here you can also see the uh, four by fours that were used to house the glazing when it, when, uh, it is installed. And then this is what the home looks like when it's nearly completed. So adding a solar voltaic system done right is more than just buying panels. There are many things you can do to your home to ensure that your new solar system or home will perform at its optimum. Uh, and certainly if you've got an existing home or if you're building a home, you, you, we certainly recommend having a professional energy auditor uh, do an air blower test and check all the areas that he is trained to know about where your home can be losing heat. Uh, and before you do that, if you're so inclined, you could use our clipboard home energy checklist, which was created by the Heartland Renewable Energy Society. And this is what that looks like. As you can see it's got three columns and this, this is a check mark to say, I'm done with this particular item. And then it's got, it's divided into areas of the home, like this area here is attics and crawl spaces. This area here is wall insulation. And this area here is basements and crawl spaces. And then as you're going through these areas, you would put your notes or your findings uh, about, uh, about what's in the home. So another area, I'll go through the areas 
We have an air infiltration area. We have an HVAC and fireplace area. We'll have a windows area. We'll have water systems, lifestyle and miscellaneous, landscaping and checking the exterior. And then this little guy here is a, a, a cheapo air infiltration tester. You've got a pencil and scotch tape to it. It is light cellophane that you use to wrap food in. It's very light. And so you can take this device and hold it next to an outlet or next to a window or next to a door. And if, it's, if there's air coming through there, it'll move around, it'll blow. And you can say, this is an area that I've got an air leakage problem. Now the professionals use smoke, which is a lot, uh, a lot better than this, but for you without buying a smoke machine, uh, this will enable you to find out where your home is leaking air. And then we also have um, uh, helpful links to, uh, uh, to areas to make you smarter about what you're about to do with the energy in your home. And uh, so this is the home energy checklist. You can find that on our website. And I'm going blank a little bit. Ken told me, Ken does our website. And let's see, uh, that's in our getting ready section uh, on our website at the top. Uh, so uh, you can find it and a couple other things there at that location. So looking uh, at closely at one of, one of these areas, like when you're in your attic in this space for attic and crawl spaces, measure attic insulation, is it uniform? How much insulation do you have? We recommend you get at least 14 to 16 inches and use cellulose loose fill. And then you've got the other areas shown there. And then for air infiltration, it's got all these various areas that talk about air infiltration. So if you look at doors, it says check the threshold and jam weather stripping to see if there is light or air coming through. It may be time to replace the bottom threshold threshold side uh, and top bottom uh, and adding storm window uh, can help reduce heat losses. So I'm gonna pass the baton over to Ken Reed, who's the current president of the Heartland Renewable Energy Society. And I'm going to stop my share. And Ken, it's time for you to uh, wake up from your slumber and make your part of the presentation. All right. I would point out, uh, Craig, if you would, when I am done with my presentation, if you remind me, I'll show everybody where to look on the uh, website, the HRES website for you, the clipboard audit. Yeah, and you might also, uh, while you're there, just kind of show them uh, how to use the website and what is underneath each of the bars at the top of the page. All that right. might be helpful. I will do that. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, it's going to take me just a second here. I'm going to need to uh, share a screen. And this will look funny for a second. But if I do that and then I do this, I think we're good. You're good. All right. Okay. So as Craig said, I'm Ken Reed, and uh, he and I have been at this renewable energy, solar energy, energy conservation efficiency game for a very long time. Craig built houses back in the early 80s, and I could go into my background, which I really think I'll go to this first, but I will say that Back in 1979, 80, 81 timeframe, I was uh, an instructor at the largest solar program in the, in the United States, which was the Red Rock Solar Program, where we had over 500 solar students. And I was the only instructor of the whole group of us that had both credentials in energy efficiency and solar energy. So at the time, that was kind of a brand new um, in fact, no one had gotten that credential before because they told me I was the first in Colorado, but you know, I'm, lots of people have been in this business now. But anyway, that shows that we've been in this for a pretty long time. So getting into the presentation, Craig talked about do it yourself or do your own solar or do your own energy efficiency. And so I'm going to take it the next step because if you uh, are going to look for air leaks, you can use the uh, pencil and saran wrap idea, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want to find the air leaks, you need to do, use what's called a blower door. And I'll show you that here in a second. 
But uh, that is typically what a home energy auditor or a home energy rater will bring with them. And that will be their primary testing tool. They'll have other ones with them, most likely, like a duct tester or duct blaster, if you normally try to test the ducts, or at least they should. And then maybe possibly an infrared camera and some other items that they, they will bring with them. But at the very least, they should have a blower door. So quickly, I'm going to say that a lot of folks have heard the term energy auditor. That was used a lot back in uh, when uh, President Obama got the first stimulus package out and, and they were starting to ramp up the training and all that. The term energy auditor was used a lot. But there's another term called a home energy rater or HERS rater. And a rater is basically like an energy auditor. They more or less do the same thing. They analyze the energy components of a home, a residence, or potentially even a small commercial building if it has residential heating and cooling systems, which there's a lot of those around too, like maybe a dentist office that is in a home and they just convert it over to a dentist office, but it still has the same heating, cooling equipment Then a Hertz Raider can analyze that as well. Um, so it says on this slide at the bottom, basically a home energy Raider can do a few more things than an energy auditor can because they have quality assurance oversight, three different versions or three different levels. They report to a provider. The provider reports to a, a, a national organization called ResNet. And then ResNet uh, sets everything up to the federal government and on a national rating, uh, basically a rating list or rating board, which we're not gonna talk about that here, except to say, you can go out and uh, probably have that information on their HRES website pretty soon about how to find out about if the home in your area has had a, a home energy rating because that information is public information. So anyway, the other things that a home energy rater or HERS rater can do real quickly is they can do energy code inspections on behalf of an energy or building code department. So since codes have gotten much more, I don't know if the word would be stringent, but they've gotten much more comprehensive in that codes, energy codes especially now spell out what levels of insulation you should have what types of windows and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the HERS rater can go out with the equipment and do the testing on behalf of a, a building or uh, energy code department for a city or municipality or county. And uh, then report back and they, the information they give back can be used to, for code compliance. And the biggest thing in my mind is that home energy raters can, can start a, what's called an energy mortgage which I think we'll touch on that again. And that means you can get access to private sector financing and energy mortgages are quite unique in that they will give you real value for all the energy efficiency, clean energy uh, items and green to, to, to a certain degree, even the green items you install in a home. But the primary looks at the, the things you do in your home that will save energy and therefore save money, which affects your, uh, your financing. So let's see here, next slide. So. A professional energy audit is not to be confused with the kind of energy audits that energy utilities or government programs typically do because most of those are, are basically generated by a rebate program or some kind of a incentive program that they're, they're giving out. So you go out and have an energy audit done, you contact the utility when they come out, it's a free audit typically or a very low cost. And then uh, they will help you get financing or provide you with LED bulbs or, 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 or maybe a rebate if you put in a new water heater or a new heat pump or whatever it might happen to be. Uh, of course, the fees for audits can vary very much between companies and programs. And so um, you can get a list of energy auditors and even home energy raters from the, locally from the Metropolitan Energy Center by calling 531-SAVE are going to their metroenergy.org website. And now we're not affiliated with the Metropolitan Energy Center, but they maintain a list of energy auditors and home energy raters. So I, I like to talk, if I'm gonna talk about these things, I like to show where you can in fact get that information if you wanna follow up. Professional energy ratings can also be, like I said, uh, you can find out you know, local raters through the MEC or Metropolitan Energy Center. And so some of the things that raters can do that energy auditors cannot do is enable residential energy or renewable energy tax credits. You have to engage the help of a home energy rater. And I should say certified home energy rater because they all have to be certified as well, pass a number of tests, national tests, and uh, prove that they know how to use the equipment and et cetera. 
They're, they can certify homes as Energy Star, Energy Auditors cannot. And then they also certify green homes through programs like the uh, USGBC Lead for Homes program or through the National Association of Home Builders National Green Building Standard program. And like I said earlier, they also can facilitate or help uh, homeowners get energy mortgages that take into account the energy savings. And they'll also almost always, depending on the situation, make the home have higher market value once the, all the improvements are completed, inspected, and certified. So um, just trying to differentiate here that something that a lot of people are not aware of. And so blower desks pretty much are mandatory if, if first and foremost because almost all homes, unless they're purposely built to be airtight, will leak. How bad they'll leak is, of course, dependent on how well they're built and what materials are used and how conscientious, and really that's a real key, how conscientious the tradespeople, the builder, or the contractors, how 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 you know proud they are of the work they do. It's easy to throw a house together. It takes a little time, effort, and skill to make a house quality where it's uh, tight, airtight. And it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal, but your air leaks will cost you a lot of money over the course of time. So by using a blower door helps you find the air leaks. And the nice thing about air leaks is that they're not that expensive typically to fix. They typically a little bit of caulk, some weather stripping in the doors or windows, things like that will fix most of it. And attic air bypasses are very prevalent. What that is, is if you could go in your attic and you see your plumbing stack, which is the typically the white PVC pipe that goes up through your attic to the outside to allow your plumbing system to vent, or your uh, flue that goes up through the attic and up to the through the roof that lets the uh, flue gases come out of your furnace. If you look at those and happen to be in the attic and look down them, a lot of times, nearly almost always, you'll be able to see from the top of your attic floor all the way to your basement or crawl space or wherever your heating cooling system is located. And so that means that air has a direct conduit or pass or bypass basically all the way through your home, up and down. And so you need to seal those off with things that can withstand, especially if on a flu, you need to seal off with metal and silicone caulk, or they have a foam that's a, a foam in a can that is red in color. It's a fire rated foam that you can also use to seal off hot areas like that or around can lights because they get hot as well, especially if they have an incandescent bulb in them. Okay, the other thing is, is that the rim joist, which is where the piece of wood, the two by four, two by six, whatever it might happen to be, the wood that lays at the very base of your house, that the one, the one that's in contact with your foundation, doesn't matter if your foundation is concrete or a field stone or even a, a wood, an engineered wood foundation, whatever you happen to have as a foundation, that one board that's between your foundation and the, the upper part of your house, that's your rim joist. And since almost all foundations, either if they're rock or even concrete, will be rough on top, unless they take a lot of time to smooth them, which doesn't normally happen. When you put wood on top of a rough surface, there's gonna be air gaps. And so it's pretty easy to find that there's air leakage, pretty good amount, significant amount, typically where the rim joist meets the foundation. And then Craig said, you'll find air leaks around doors and windows. And it's very common that people will replace their windows, especially the windows, thinking that the windows are a problem. And really, most always, the problem is not the window. The problem is that when windows are put into your rough frame on your home, there's a gap around the window on purpose so that they have room to move the window around and get it square and plumb. And, and they need a little wiggle room. Well, if they don't put a little non-expansive foam around that or, or put some kind of a good um, air leakage barrier of some kind. And normally if they do anything, they'll stuff a little fiberglass in there, which helps a little. But if you know furnace filters and you've never looked at a cheap one, they're all made out of fiberglass. So it basically lets air pass through. It's not a good air stopping air barrier, but non-expansive or minimally expansive foam is what you use. That's the best product. And if you just can open up the trim around your window on the inside, put this foam around it, close it back up, that'll be almost as good as replacing with new windows. I won't say it is as good, but almost all the time that people think their windows are leaking, what's really happening is that they're getting air leakage around their windows. So, so when you decide if you want to go ahead and get an energy audit or a rating, what's the reason you want to do it? What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And so it's, uh, we get different reasons why people wanted to do it. They are often it's their home's not comfortable 
And uh, maybe they have a room over the garage or a room up in the top of the home. A lot of homes in Kansas City, the, the upper room doesn't have enough heating or cooling going to it to keep it adequately cool this summer, especially. And so they get, want to use the room for their student, their, their kid has grown up down, they're going to college, they want to have their own place, but they can't afford it. So they decide to stay in that attic area and it's not comfortable. So we can do an energy analysis and figure out a way to make that room more comfortable or maybe bring some extra heating cooling up there by changing the duct work or whatever it might happen to be. Um, so comfort is a reason that people have an energy analysis done. Energy costs are always a reason. And that's one of the things that seems to go up all the time. I have very few people I've ever asked that say, do you think energy costs will go down over time? And almost everybody says, yeah, no, I don't think so. And then I really don't think so either. We've been in this for a long, long time. And it's pretty much a steady increase as far as the cost of energy. And it can jump significantly or there can be other things happen. But again, that's another topic. Does your home, uh, does it have, uh, if you look at your glass, say on a sunny day, do you notice air or a little a piece of dirt and things floating in the air, little particles, you might need to have uh, some better filtration or some better ventilation system in there to help keep your air cleaner and improve your indoor air quality. And a lot of folks don't think about the fact that what they bring into their home, sometimes carpets have a lot of formaldehyde or some kind of uh, VLC, volatile organic compound in it that outgasses in the house. <clears throat> Cleaning materials, a lot of those will emit stuff in the air that's not all that healthy. So it's more and more important that I'm more and more folks are catching on to the fact that what they bring into the home stays in the home. So you want to try to stay with the more uh, safe, non-toxic items, clean with things like, uh, uh, well, again, I, I don't want to get into that too much, but there's a lot of non-toxic, <clears throat> healthy cleaning materials available now. If your home is dusty, then that typically is an indicator that you've got air leaks and, uh, and or you've got fiberglass getting into your house. And so another reason to insulate, uh, not insulate, but uh, do the blower door test and seal up the, the air gaps. Now also, if you're gonna increase the efficiency of your home, many people make the mistake of putting in a new heating cooling system, and then they decide to upgrade the efficiency of their home. You're much better off to do it the opposite way Make your home as efficient as possible, then get your energy analysis done and, and make sure if they have more suggestions from your energy auditor or energy rater to make your home even more efficient, take those suggestions into account and perform those things, then size your heating and cooling system to your new lower energy load. If your home happens to have a three ton air conditioner and a 100,000 BTU hour furnace, and you go through it and increase the efficiency and tighten it up and do all the things you can, and then you have them check your home now and they say, well, now your home only needs about a 60,000 BTR furnace and only a two and a half ton air conditioner, then you're much better off to put in the smaller equipment because it'll still keep you comfortable. It'll lessen your energy bills. It won't run as much as far as the heating side. Cooling side has to be sized correctly. The air conditioner or heat pump does need to run a, a decent amount of time to dehumidify. So you don't want to oversize that for sure. And this is just basic rules of thumb, but if your air conditioner is oversized, especially the coil that's in your furnace or air handler on the inside, if it's too big, it won't get cold enough to get the moisture out of the air. So all these things, they, their house is a system and they all can work for you or against you. So a heating cooling system and air conditioner can be sized to your new highly efficient home by your home energy auditor or home energy rater. And then it's always a good idea, which is why Craig talked about it first, if you make your home as energy efficient as possible, it's very likely that the solar energy system or the clean energy system you wanna add after you've made your home more efficient and done all these things won't have to be quite as large. So that makes your expense for putting in that clean energy system less than you would have had to pay to have it installed earlier when your home was just wasting energy. So the smart way to go about putting in a clean energy system is to replace your older air conditioner or your old air furnace or whatever that's not as efficient as the new stuff. Try to put that in first. And it's best to replace an old air conditioner with a high efficiency heat pump for a couple of reasons. One, heat pumps, if you've got a day when it's relatively, uh, not that cold outside, but it's relatively cool, like a 50 degree day, and you're trying to keep your home 70 degrees inside, a heat pump can can transport or take the heat from the outside air, move it inside so efficiently, it's gonna be one of the most efficient heating and cooling systems you can have. 
it starts losing its efficiency as it gets colder outside. So at some point, typically around freezing to around 20 degrees Fahrenheit, in that range, a heat pump starts to lose enough efficiency and the demand for heat energy of your, for your home to keep it warm increases to the point that they hit what's called a balance point where the, the heat pump can't quite keep up with the demand for heat energy that keeps your house comfortable. And then you have to kick in a backup system of some kind. And that could be a fossil fuel furnace, or it could be an electric heating strip, or it could be wood stove, or it could be even the solar heat stored into a, some kind of a thermal system like rocks or liquid. But um, this is all could be designed out in advance, depending on what your goals are that you want to achieve. Another thing is if you're going to put in a uh, new refrigerator, a lot of folks take the old refrigerator and then stick it in the basement, stick it in the garage, take it outside and have it for the workshop or the man cave or something. It's best to not have that old unit anymore because um, well, it's going to use more energy than a new uh, refrigerator freezer combo, almost guaranteed. And you don't really gain anything. In fact, you lose ground if you keep the old refrigerator and plug in a second refrigerator. So you try to keep your equipment Getting a bigger primary refrigerator that's highly efficient is probably the smartest move than two smaller old ones, is what I'm trying to say. And so don't keep those used, and especially if you're going to put them in a garage or something, because a lot of folks will do that. So it's hot in the garage all summer, the fridge has to run all the time to try to keep cool. And then when you open it up, you'll find that there's only one six pack of beer in there and some popsicles that have melted. So it's like, why are you spending all this money on energy when you don't, you know, take that one six pack and put it in the fridge inside the house? So, and the reason I talked about heat pumps earlier is that we're going to see more and more push, especially with the Biden energy plan that's going to be coming out from President Biden and administration. We're going to be seeing a push for heat pump versions of clothes dryers and heat pump versions of water heaters. That's because you can heat, it takes a little longer to heat using a heat pump than electric resistance heat for dryers or for water heaters, but not that bad. I mean, let's say it takes 20 minutes to heat your water heater with uh, electric resistance, it might take 40 minutes, but most people are, are going to use the water immediately again. You take a shower, then you don't use water again for a while. And if the heat pump runs a little while, to most people, it makes no difference. But the energy efficiency aspect of it and what you're going to pay to heat that water is quite a bit different. So we'll be seeing push for more pushes for getting out, getting away from natural gas and other fossil fuels, uh, heating oil, things like that, propane, more toward heat pumps. And then if you put in a solar photovoltaic solar electric system, you can even power those heat pumps using solar energy. And then you're looking at, in essence, free energy to do that. So the other thing too, is if you're getting uh, a microwave or any type of item that uses electricity, almost all of them now, you can find an Energy Star version of that. Energy Star versions are available for monitors and for computers and the whole bit. And I'm pretty sure everybody watching this has heard of Energy Star uh, all this stuff is is available. So, in fact, I'm going to talk about that here. That computers, copiers, and office equipment, almost all of it has Energy Star versions. And if you look for that, the second point is, is if you get on the Energy Star website at energystar.gov and you search, you can typically find the most efficient unit of that unit. You can find a copier that uses the least electricity. And then if you look at one of your things that your magazines are online for, the real reliability of that or the consumer confidence in it. If you can find a good product that has a low energy consumption, you've got it made. And then everything that has a remote, whether it's a television set or, or a uh, you know, amplifier for your music system or anything that has a remote is going to, if it's a, I mean, I don't mean the kinds that are connected to with the wire. I'm talking about a battery powered remote means that you're, TV set has to have a, a energy consumption even on standby. Even when it looks like it's off, it's technically still on and using a small amount of electricity so that when you press the button on your remote, it pops it on. So if you're trying to save the maximum amount of electricity, you want to put the items like your TV and things like that on a power strip so you can kick it off. And then when you're ready to have the TV come on, you just flick the power strip on first and now your remote will work. But uh, a lot of folks will not go to that much trouble because if you forget to turn it back on, you're wondering what's wrong with the television set and all, but it is the way that you can knock your bills down even more. So basically all your non-essential items, especially that are gonna sit on standby, um, like if you only use your, your um, entertainment system once a week because it's like you're maybe have an overhead 
uh, projector that you don't use often, and that could be on a power strip. So you just turn it off because you're not going to use it until you have company, things like that. So the energystar.gov website has the most efficient models listed. And on the Heartland Renewable Energy website, we have what's called a wattage requirements for common appliances. I don't know how well you can see this, but if you're going to put on a clean energy system and install one on your home, like a, a solar system or a wind energy system, or even other things, potentially, I don't know how the future will go in terms of certain things, but if we start moving toward hydrogen and fuel cells or something, you still want to look at what's your load, what, what, what are your requirements for electricity, what are you going to be demanding of the system you're putting in. So uh, it's pretty easy to, if you use a chart like this to say, well, what would it, my, my, well, let's start with the top. An air conditioner, saying a one ton air conditioner uses about 1500 watts. And I think that's about right because I've done testing on homes uh, on some of the uh, jobs I've had in the past and some of the things I've done and doing energy analysis and all uh, that a three ton air conditioner uses about 4,500 watts. So this seems to be about right. And a three ton air conditioner is uh, 36,000 BTUs, but the wattage is up normally about 4,000 to 4,500. Could be as low as 3,500. The less wattage again, the more efficient it is. So, and then something else might be like a blow dryer uses about a thousand watts. And then things that you don't think about too often like electric blankets and aquariums. I've noticed that people forget they have aquariums and the electric little electric heater and aquariums actually consume a lot of juice over the course of time because they run a lot. Dehumidifiers, if you think, well, how my bill, why is my bill so high? If you got a dehumidifier that runs a lot, that may be one of the reasons. Um, anyway, Going through this, you can see that refrigerators are listed here. Typical refrigerator uses about 540 watts and a smaller one, maybe 400 watts. But if you get into a Sunfrost refrigerator, which we'll talk again here in just a minute, which is a DC version of a refrigerator, you're talking only 100 watts, a little over 100 watts. So you can see you're going to use a fifth of the energy that you would for a regular refrigerator. Now, you may or may not be happy with the Sunfrost because they're typically not as big as the regular refrigerator. So some of these are lifestyle decisions. Do you want, how far do you want to go with your efficiency? So you go through this list and say, well, I do have a coffee pot. I run a lot. Well, that's 1200 watts. I run my dishwasher a lot. There's 1500 watts. So you add all this up and say, I think I'm going to probably have at any given point in time about 4,000 to 5,000 watts potentially running at any given time. That means your solar system, if you want to be 100% solar powered, you're going to need a solar system that produces at least around 5,000 watts or 5 kW. That's not a huge solar system, but that is a good sized one in terms of that's about typical. Okay, so the nice thing is we're going to, we still have things like cost efficiency uh, or efficiency improvement tax credits for energy efficiency, if I can say this correctly. The, the residential energy efficiency tax credit is still available. It's a lifetime uh, credit of $500. So once you've gotten your $500 credit, you cannot get another one. But what it means is that you can claim the $500 credit at any tax year, even now, if you, and it's mostly based on materials, not labor. So if you put insulation in the attic or you have somebody insulate your attic, and then you, if you get the materials that you paid for listing from them, then you can get that $500 credit. It's 10% of the cost of the project. So if you get a $2,000 attic insulation um, installed, then you're gonna get $200 back from Uncle Sam. And since it's a credit, it's actually literally $200 back. It's not a deduction, it's a credit. And there is an exception that any purchases made between 2009 or 2010 for that two, two year period, they would allow you to have, depending on what you installed at that point in time, you were able to get up to $1,500 just for that window of time. And so at, at this point in time, if you didn't do it then, then we've missed it. But I'm pointing that out because that is in the rules that there was a short period of time that you could have gotten up to $1,500, but it's back to 500 now. So what qualifies for efficiency equipment? Air source heat pumps, your typical standard heat pump, central air conditioning does. So you can see you can spend enough money on these items to get to your $5,000 or $500 credit really quick. Uh, water heaters um, or boilers to heat your home with, oil furnaces and fans, non-solar water heaters, the advanced main air circulating fan, which is basically your blower fan in your furnace. And what that is, is quickly what they're paying you to do 
is if you have an older furnace, it pays to take out the AC furnace fan, your blower fan, and replace it with the DC powered version. It uses a fraction of the energy that the AC version does and moves at least the same amount of air, if not more, and you get a 500 up to $500 uh, back from doing that. Of course, they don't cost 5,000, but what the point is, is that any of these things you do, you're gonna get some money back if you take advantage of it. And then biomass stoves have been added. So that's interesting, I think. Other things you can do to get your um, energy efficient improvement tax incentive is add insulation, have a Energy Star roof, or put in Energy Star windows, doors, or skylights. Not going to be hard to spend the $5,000 to get your 10% back if you want to do this. It's uh, pretty easy to get run up a $5,000 tab, even for, especially for replacing windows. And the other thing you can get for doing energy efficiency which I'm talking Kansas City area now, basically, is that you can get residential rebates for installing efficient equipment that they will pay you a rebate for. And I don't know how well you can see this, but in the terms of City of, of Independence, Missouri, um, I used to run this program, by the way, and way back when I worked with them, that let's say you put in a um, 14 and a half SEER uh, Energy Star heat pump then you're going to get $390 back if it's got a furnace as a backup, and you're going to get $465 rebate if you're an all electric home. So there's almost another 500 right there. So you need to not overlook these because it's a, to your financial advantage to, to take advantage of these. And they use, Evergy also offers rebates. It's in this text on the left. Up to $500 for replacing your central air, $700 for replacing air source heat pump, and even up to $1,500 if you go ahead and put in a ground source heat pump. So we'll talk about electricity being produced and then we'll go into the clean energy aspect. So energy, for those of you that haven't really watched this particular, or you know, if, if this is something you're not aware of how it works, which most everybody is, electricity is typically produced in a main area, a power plant, typically in our area of the world, coal fired power plant. And that cr creates a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of electrical energy. That energy is pushed into a transformer, which steps the voltage up to a very high voltage, which makes it easier for it to go longer distances on the higher voltage transmission lines. Once they go to the main area they're, that they're sent to, which is typically a substation, you're in the, the area, the substation in your part of town will step the voltage down to a more, uh, to, a, to a lower standard, let's put it that way. And it varies from Evergy to Independence Power and Light. And uh, most of the utilities have a little bit different set of rules, set of voltage standards that they use. And then your distribution line. So you've got a transmission line that is high, super high voltage, a distribution line that is basically a lower voltage by, by quite an amount, but it's not stepped down to your house voltage. So you go to one more transformer near your home, which typically serves two or three or four homes. And that transformer will step the voltage down to what we typically use in a home, which is 220, 240 volts for things like your electric oven, your electric water heater, your electric clothes dryer, uh, things like that, or 120, 110, 120, which is in our outlets and our lighting and what we run our, our microwaves on and things like that. So now that we've talked about electricity coming to you from standard conventional sources, which is either coal, could be wind systems, could be a, a large field of solar uh, solar panels near your home. But right now, more often than not, it's gonna be coal for a little while longer as we transition away from it. But now that we know how the electricity gets to your home, we're gonna talk about ways to lessen your electric bill. But to do that, you're almost always gonna to have to enlist the help of a solar installer or a wind energy installer. But for now, we're talking solar. So these are some questions based on people who have been in the business a long time, say you should always ask these questions before you plunk down a considerable amount of money for a solar system. How, how long has this company been in business? And it's nice to know if they've been around at least five years or longer, because uh, I hate to say this, but the solar installation business is not a, an easy business and a lot of companies come and go not really all their fault because tax credits come and go, administrations come and go. It's a not a 
business to get into and think that you've got it made for the long term because it's some solar companies have been in for uh, been in business for quite a while but a lot of them come and go and I, I I hate that about it but that's that's so you want to find one that's been around a while it's nice to know that they've installed quite a few systems that's especially nice if they will be willing to give you a few references and you really if you get references you really do need to call up the references because it's been known for companies to give out references and then once you call them you find out that the people really aren't that happy with the installation but if you don't follow up you just think oh i got a bunch of references they must be good so it's always a good idea to check the references at least a little bit to make sure that the reference people are happy with their installations companies that just start in the business probably best that you don't use them unless you know that they came from another company and been in this a while you can find out how how qualified they are without having to do a whole lot of digging the next thing you want to know is what is your warranty because there's different parts to a solar energy system installation you've got your solar modules which are we all call panels uh, which is the actual unit per itself that uh, is installed on your roof or whatever it's a, technically a module but everybody calls them panels and then you have inverters and there's several types of those there's the micro or mini inverters that are little inverters on the back of each panel and then there's also centralized inverters and those take a, quite a group of panels or a, a, an array of solar panels, all the energy produced by them, and then it converts the electricity, DC electricity current into alternating current that you use to power your home. So basically, your solar panels or your solar modules create sunlight into DC current. The DC current is sent to an inverter, which converts that sunlight into or sunlight DC power into AC power. And then the balance of system is yet another thing that could have a different warranty. So you could have one warranty on your solar panels, you have another warranty on your inverter, and you could have a third warranty on balance of system. And what that is, is the mounting system that's used to hold the solar panels in place, the wiring and all the, the, the contections and everything may potentially have a warranty in terms of like a maintenance warranty or a, uh, a balance of system warranty of some kind. Ask if you can get an extended warranty. And if it's possible, make sure that extended warranty is covered by someone that is not just just the company, but is an, a long standing company that is in the warranty business. Um, and then also ask, because it's always a good idea, what's not covered in that warranty? And they should be able to tell you. And then another thing to talk about and to do upon any installation of a solar system, and this holds true to for a wind energy system or even any kind of big project that you have is that what is the experience of the installers? Are they sending out the guy to sell you the, to initially sell you on buying a solar system? Is that the guy who owns the company and knows a lot about it, but then does he send out brand new people to actually put it in? Who's gonna put in your solar system? Find that out. If they're insured and bonded, that's excellent because if they fail to put it in, they go out of business, go bankrupt or something mid installation. If they're bonded, that means that there'll be money to finish the system by somebody else. And then the way you wanna do this is once you get uh, figured out what you want, give them a third of the money upon signing of your agreement or your contract. Another third, once the installation begins, once they show up with the equipment and the solar panels and all that, and you see them starting to put them on the roof, they get that second third, but don't give them the last third of money until everything's approved by both the utility saying it's installed correctly, connect to the lines correctly, and the building department or energy codes department, whoever it is that does the final inspections. If they're all happy, and everything is working and, and all of them, that's when they get their last chunk of money. So going back to efficiency and using less energy, if you really want to keep the solar system cost down, then what you tend to do or want to do is to lower your energy consumption or the, the size of your appliances that suck energy. And so if you're looking for things like low wattage freezers or refrigerators, the DC versions, then you can find them from these green retailers and they're not recommended by us necessarily because these are separate companies than from Heartland Renewable, but these have been around for a while. Real Goods has been around selling uh, solar equipment and things like high efficiency heating, cooling or uh, refrigerators and things like that for a long, long time. I'm thinking 40 years now. Sunfrost is a name that's been around for just as long as any DC refrigerator company has been in business just about. And another name is Norcold. These, these uh, three Link can help you find a high efficiency DC powered refrigerator. Then another way to use solar energy is to heat your floor with it 
And the way that it used to happen primarily is to heat liquid, typically at an antifreeze solution of some kind, which is with water with ethylene glycol typically, circulate it through specialized flexible plastic tubing. And then that would be in a serpentine panel uh, pattern that once you pour the concrete over it, it would tend to heat the floor evenly. But now they have electrical embedded wiring systems they can put in the, in the concrete or you can have as an overlay like a carpet or a rug or something on top or in even a wall system now that's a low, low wattage DC powered heating system that heats you with radiant energy that you can use your photovoltaic system. So now you don't have to worry about air, uh, water leaks or things like that. And then there are set and renewable energy tax incentives. So we talked earlier about energy efficiency tax incentives. Now you get a 26% solar renewable energy tax credit for the installation of your solar system. So if you put in a $10,000 solar system, you can get $2,600 back from Uncle Sam, which means that that's $2,600 directly back to you from your taxes. It's a tax credit, not an, a deduction. So, so if any system put in by 2019, which is now, you know, not, not recent, but if you had a system installed by 2000, end of 2019, you would have got a 30% tax credit. Anything installed after that date up to the year 2023, January 1st of 2023 gets the 26% that I'm talking about for your tax credit or incentive. And then after the date of January 1st, 23, it goes to 22%. And then after January 1st of 2024, it goes to zero. At least that's the way it's written right now. So it behooves everybody who wants to put in a solar system or wind energy system. This is a renewable energy tax credit. These aren't solar. It could be anything that qualifies for as a renewable energy system, 26% of the cost. And so thermal systems also qualify, which is like the solar hot air system or a solar liquid uh, system that maybe heats your domestic hot water. Um, I've been told by a number of entities that since heat pump water heaters are, are readily available, that you're almost better off to put in a photovoltaic system and power your heat pump water heater. And now you don't have to worry about solar panels leaking on your roof or some kind of pipe breaking in your attic or a water heater that fails, solar water tank failing in your basement. You don't have any of that because you're using electricity. So it is, it, it's cleaner, it's easier than the maintenance is, well, the maintenance is almost nil. So back to the uh, credits, here are the incentives. There's no maximum, which is really nice. And the principal residences and your second homes qualify, but your rental homes do not. So if you have a vacation home at Lake of the Ozarks or someplace and you put a solar system on it, you can get your 26% back. Qualifying for your renewable energy tax incentive is geothermal heat pumps, small wind turbines that are residential and sized in nature, solar energy, electric systems, or thermal, fuel cells, and micro turbines, and also biomass fuel stoves. This is another new one um, that uh, you can use to burn the biomass, which biomass could be, and literally could be grass clippings in a way. I don't know if that would necessarily count as a fuel, but I don't know why not. Biomass is basically leftover growth. Uh, what's left behind when they get wheat, all the chaff that's on their field floor could be turned into biomass fuel. So financing your solar system or your renewable energy installation, you should try to find at least three different loan companies that will give you, quote you, interest rates and all that. In my experience, or I, I have to recommend that if you can purchase your system, but if you can get a loan on it, you're better off than leasing simply because leasing is easier. A company might come to you and say, all you have to do is sign here, we'll put it in, you'll save money, all is copacetic. But what they're also not telling you is that any solar tax incentive goes to them. And if there ever happens to be a day, and I don't think we're far off from it, where we start getting what they call white tags and green tags, which is uh, for uh, energy efficiency and green energy installations, which is, gives you some extra money incentives, um, those also go to the leasing company. So if you can purchase, you're better off in terms of, especially in getting the benefits of it. And then 
it also, if you own it and you sell the home, you then that goes with it and all that. You don't have to deal with the leasing problem and stuff. But it, it's it, leasing is easier. It's simply the company puts it in and that's that. And they maintain it, whatever, depending on your agreement. And you save some money, but you don't really have any benefits of ownership because you don't own it. So you want to always check with your local bank savings and loans and credit unions to get your best rate on a solar system installation. And uh, I've been told by one of our HRS board members that Interbank has less than a 2% loan available right now uh, that's associated with Elon Musk and company for the installation of solar energy, renewable energy systems. So to just briefly address this, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but there's basically two types of solar or renewable energy systems out there. And that's it. You've got your grid connected system, which means that you're using the utility, your electric utility as more or less a battery for you. And that when you overproduce electricity through your solar system, it feeds back to the utility. When you need more energy than your solar system produces or at night when your solar system isn't producing anything, now you're drawing electricity back from the utility. So basically it's a, a to and fro or you're buying and selling back and forth to the utility. And almost all the power agreements at this point in time, I won't say all of them, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not aware of all of them, but there's, not, there's a good substantial number of agreements between solar system homeowner, uh, homeowners who have solar systems and electric utilities that say, we'll sell you electricity at retail rates and we'll pay you for your electricity at avoided cost or wholesale rates. So they, you may be buying electricity for 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and you may be getting three cents for everything you sell back. So it isn't really a good idea. A lot of folks say, well, I'm going to oversize my solar system and make money by selling the electricity back to the utility. It doesn't really pencil out to be that great of an idea. What you want to do is size the solar system to your needs. And even at that, most folks don't realize that when they put in a solar system, if they don't put in batteries at the same time, their solar system, even on a sunny day, will produce zero if the utility goes down because the solar systems are tied to the grid. And so once the grid goes down, your solar system inverters are designed to kill the power to the solar system as well because you cannot backfeed electricity from your home into the grid it's illegal because the linemen who are working to restore your power don't know that power is coming from your home. There's no way for them to know that. So basically the homes have to be shut off or your businesses, any solar system connected to the grid, if the grid goes down, the solar systems by law have to disconnect. And then if you don't have any kind of backup system, there are some solar inverters now that will go ahead and continue to power your home, but disconnect from the utility but the best way to do this is to have some batteries. And so real briefly, I wanna say it's real good idea. You don't necessarily have to power your entire home with the solar system to make sure that you have a, a, an insurance policy. Let's say it that way. If your electricity goes out, um, the grid goes down and all of a sudden everybody in your neighborhood has no power, you included, if you have just a small backup system that still gives you enough power to power your refrigeration so your food doesn't go bad, your, your uh, security system so you're protected, your, your uh, mobile devices and things so you have your communications with the world, and some lighting, security lighting and things like that. And then maybe if you have a little, a little, a little extra electricity, maybe you can watch TV or listen to the radio or something. But bottom line, it is probably not a bad idea to put in a small backup battery system that is your emergency backup so that if push comes to shove, we have an ice storm, everybody loses power, and you're not going to get power back for a while, but you have enough power to power your, and also the other thing you want to hook to it, if you have a furnace or heat pump or whatever in your home, and you put in that DC fan that doesn't use a lot of power, you're going to want to connect that fan to your backup system as well, so you can blow uh, some air around your home, and if it's a gas furnace, you'll still have heat, no small matter. So this shows in the right here, you see uh, just a few batteries. This is not enough batteries to power an entire home. You'd have to have several uh, groups of batteries like this to power an entire home, but this would be considered a decent number of batteries to power an emergency backup system in a home. And then I think that my last slide is a lot of folks are very interested in getting a Tesla battery system and so that typically is, uh, well, I won't go into what it costs dollar-wise exactly, but 
once you start getting into battery backup systems of any kind, there is a significant cost attached to them, especially if you want to size it to produce enough power to power your home entirely. So I would say that um, it's, you're probably looking for a Tesla, and I, I'm not going to say this as a absolute, but I have heard that it costs around $10,000 for the first Tesla Powerwall installation. I could be wrong now. I may have changed, but so you can see it's not a small consideration. And if I go back a slide, if I can get it to do that real quick, the batteries like this that you can get Trojans or whatever you might happen to buy that are more or less just a, a gel battery or something that doesn't, that, that's not like the Tesla, you might be able to get a little bit better deal. It might be not as expensive, but then you don't get some of the other things that you do get with a more sophisticated system. So again, research is suggested. And you, when you talk to an installation company, you can ask them what are my options. Always a good idea. And so with that, oh, wait, I'm not quite done. The solar energy industry, as everybody knows, is in flux. The, uh, the um, solar panels are coming down in price all the time. And so it's one of those industries you have to keep tabs on to see what's happening, how, well, you know, what's happening now. And, and it's gonna be a lot less expensive if I wait. A lot of times it isn't because the energy you could save by putting in a solar system now might more than pay for whatever you might pay less a year from now. Um, it just depends on, on your situation. But we'll have more information about solar energy, uh, the industry, on our website at heartlandrenewable.org. There's also a, a website called Desire USA, D S I R E, and that's Database of State Incentives and Renewable Energy for the United States. And that has the tax credits information, both state uh, level and federal level and regional level. And then MOSIA is the Missouri Solar Energy Industries Association. And right now there is no Kansas MOSIA uh, version right at the moment, but if you wanna find out installers that work both in Missouri and Kansas, if they're on the MOSIA, MOSIA website, then they've, gone, they've been vetted to a, a pretty good degree. So if you go to that, and you go to this link where it says mosia.com slash index slash installer members, it'll have a listing of all of the approved installation companies so you can find somebody who will install your renewable energy system. And this is what the Mosia website looks like. The basic website itself is mosia.com. And then we're at a point now where it's time for questions and answers, and I haven't really been tracking that. so. Hopefully we have Bob available to help us with that. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got several questions and one about tankless hot water systems and energy efficiency. What about them? Are, are, are tankless water systems a good idea? I, I can't answer that, but I'm gonna to have to preface it with, this is my own particular, I don't, uh, it's not a, my opinion as to what I've been talking to people about. I've been in this a long time, just like Craig has. And you hear about things, you talk to people and you hear about their experiences and you get feedback. Every water heater out there, whether it's a tank type water heater or a tankless, as the water passes through and it gets heated, the water tends to release the minerals in it and it tends to coat the surfaces. You can open up a bottom of any tank type water heater and you'll notice if you would take a, 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 a blade and just cut off the bottom third of a water heater you'll see that there's a buildup of sludge which primarily consists of, um, of a calcium type deposit at the bottom of your water heater if it's a gas fired water heater if it's electric water heater then you have two electric elements that go in there called uh, cow rod units that are basically uh, like a long metal rod that goes in there and they'll be coated with calcium so the thing that does tends to happen on these instantaneous tanks or tankless or whatever you want to call them is that when they get coated, you need to stop every six months or so. It's in the instructions of most of them and back flush them with muriatic acid. Most folks don't do that. Well, what happens if you don't do that? Well, I can tell you that I've learned from other people that over the course of time, if you don't black back flush your instantaneous tank periodically it may not have to be every six months it depends on how much calcium and other minerals you have in your water but if you don't back flush it periodically it will tend to clog to the point where it starts to not be able to flow as much water etc cetera, etc cetera. so 
my impression on them is, is that unless you have a way to have really clean water or you're willing to do the maintenance, you're going to want to think about that as, as, as part of your decision process, if that's okay. Does that okay. sound right? Uh, Norm uh, wants to know, um, are ductless mini split HVAC, HVAC systems good? And yes. I would say yes, but you could probably explain it better than I. Okay. Well, you know, if we could do another one of these sometime, or maybe we will do one on the, with the ways to do heating and cooling of homes is the, 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 from A to Z, from typical to the exotic. And I would say mini splits are m uncommon, but they're very common in Japan and they're very common in Israel and places like that. But they're just not common here in the United States. And what they are is when we do our heating cooling systems in our country, we tend to use ductwork for our cooling. Otherwise we could use a wood stove or something, but you wouldn't be able to move air on the cooling side. So since we have to blow air through ductwork to keep our houses cool, we tend to use forced air heating systems. And I, I, and so any home that doesn't have a, or let's just say the majority of homes built right now in our area have ductwork. But a mini split, instead of relying on ductwork to move the air throughout your home, they don't move air. <clears throat> You'll have little heads like what you see if you're in a hotel room and you have a unit in the wall and you can turn it on and off and it just the it's it's its own little heating cooling system right there underneath the window. That's called a PTAC unit or package terminal air conditioning unit. But aside of that, it's the same concept as these mini splits in that you have a head or the part of the unit and it mounts on the wall in your home and you'll have several of them. You put them in their main areas, like one in your living room, maybe one in your kitchen, maybe one in your bedroom, uh, maybe one in the basement, maybe one in your entertainment room. So you have a condenser outside that has a refrigerant line that basically splits off and goes to all these little mini heads around your house. So instead of moving air through one ductwork system, you have these little heads that have, each have its own little fan. And most all the time, they'll have a thermostat that's connected to a remote. So you can sit there and say, I want the kitchen to be 70 degrees. I want the living room to be 74 degrees. I want the bedroom to be 68. And it'll do that. But the efficiency part is, is that now that you don't have ductwork, then it stays clean. And the efficiency on those is really high. Like uh, and, and around our part of the world, getting a 14 sear heat pump or air conditioner is a pretty good one. If you get a mini split, it's mostly going to probably going to be 18 to 22 sear, meaning the seasonal energy efficiency ratio is going to be much higher. And the other big benefit of it, which I to me is a big one, is that a lot of your air conditioners or heat pumps, the outside condenser is pretty noisy. It's one big old unit. Your mini splits have a vertical unit that blows the air sideways instead of up, and they're super quiet. And uh, one other concept is that if you live in a highly energy efficient house, you care less about what's going on outside from a temperature standpoint and even a humidity standpoint than you would uh, in, a, in a regular home. Right. And you know what's nice too is if you can make a home very tight, this helps make it tight because you don't have as many perforations in the home by using a mini split. But if you have a super efficient home with plenty of insulation, Craig will tell you that people who have those, they're quiet. They're quiet. Yeah, there, there, there was a time that, uh, or several of the homes that I built used wall air conditioners and baseboard electric heat as backup. Mm -hmm. and they work fine. Yeah, because you didn't need a lot of heat input or a lot of cooling input. Right. Uh, we have a board member that was able to heat his house, and it's no small home. They heat it with his water heater. Just put a put a heating coil connected it to it. So um, here's one efficient. from Andrew who says uh, wants our opinion of PACE P A C E programs to finance uh, R E systems. All right. Well, PACE programs. The idea behind them versus if you were to get a loan for your home, you're dealing with a bank or utility, uh, not utility, a bank or credit union, something like that. If you get a PACE loan, that's tied to your house. So it's basically tied to your annual tax. When you make your pay your taxes, your your loan on your home for your so let's say you use the PACE money to install a new heating system. Okay, let's for five thousand dollars, 
then that loan is not through a, a credit union or a bank. It is basically come be on behalf of your government agency, which could be the county or could be your city. And so they have uh, basically control over the, the terms of that loan. And a lot of times the interest rates are a little higher than what you could get otherwise. And one thing that's been in the news lately is that you are probably best off to do that and still get the services of a home energy auditor, a home energy rater to tell you what you really need before you do the PACE loan. Reason being is that there's been cases where contractors came in and oversold people, especially older people on solar systems or heating cooling systems, overcharged them by a significant amount and then left and left the people high and dry and they still have to pay these loans because they're tied to their house. They're stuck, they can't get out of them. And uh, so it's, it's an opportunity for unscrupulous people to take advantage of people. So I'm not saying the PACE loans are bad. I'm saying they're a good system and they, they, they are a little more expensive typically, or at least that's what I understand, than maybe a, a loan you can get through your credit union, for example. But maybe your credit is bad, or maybe there's other reasons why you can't get a loan through your credit union. And, and the PACE will almost always loan you money for things you need, like furnaces, air conditioners, insulation, and then you pay it with your taxes. Um, just be sure that you're getting your money's worth, is my suggestion. So and, good and, program uh, where, for, for appropriate reasons. And for our last question that we've got, Ann wants to know how much battery capacity would it take to power up an electric vehicle? Okay, well, we would depend on the electric vehicle. And I was going to touch on that because we had a request to talk about electric vehicles and solar systems. A uh, back, uh, so a car. I don't know the equation off the top of my head, but the cars have a pretty good size battery to make a move. Uh, not the battery that you would find in a Prius, for example, because they use both gas and electricity. But when you have a straight battery powered car like a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla, batteries are battery sizing in the in all is pretty significant. So, and I'm not sure that the, I think what I would have to say is this, your solar system, if you could plug your car in during the day, the batteries are almost insignificant to the thing because you could use whatever your solar system produces to charge your car first and whatever's left over to charge your batteries that are in your home. In other words, you can make your car charger a priority. So, and then, then, then the secondary would be your batteries. But most people are gonna run to, well, I, 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 it used to be the case that people worked during the day and drove back and forth. Now everybody's, a lot of us are at home. If you're home during the day, then you could get away with not having that many batteries and charging your car during the day. If you're commuting, then unfortunately, your car is elsewhere during the day, not connected to your solar system, and you come home at night. Hmm. If that's what we're talking about, then you'd have to understand uh, by looking at the battery in the car as to what its uh, energy sizing is, what its consumption is. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think I'm the right person to tell you that's not my forte as far as knowing the size of a typical battery in, a, in an electric vehicle, but I know you probably have to have a significant number of batteries to charge a solar uh, or a Tesla or something overnight if you weren't connected to the grid. In other words, if you have an off-grid home and you're dependent on the batteries to charge your car, um, it's gonna be a pretty good size uh, number of, of batteries. And I, I, I think that that information might be better found I would bet that you can get all the information on the battery information on the Tesla website, on the Nissan Leaf website, and all these electric vehicle websites, they can tell you. And then you just say, well, if it needs 60 kilowatt hours to charge the battery 50%, then you can figure out how many batteries would store that to store 60 kilowatt hours at that at that amp rating. So we've, it's we've also it's talked math. about doing a, a program on electric vehicles, and I'm sure we'll save that question uh, for that workshop? It's a good question. And when I taught back at the solar program, I mentioned at the beginning that I was teaching solar students back in the late 70s and early 80s. And you have a, what it happens in insulation, it happens in a lot of things, it's called diminishing returns. And so let's talk about solar in a little different way. If you're trying to size your solar system to your average usage in your home, it's gonna be X amount big. Let's say 5kW, which is the example I talked about earlier. 
that's turning out to be kind of a national average for homes that are relying on a solar system to, to do for a typical amount of energy usage, 5,000 watts is a typical size solar system at the moment. So if you're using it for average purposes, 5,000 watts is enough. But let's say you want to have a solar electric system and a battery backup system that has enough juice to it to power your home electric heating on the coldest day of the year. Now that might have to be five times bigger solar system and you might need five times more batteries to produce enough energy, heating energy or whatever it might be for the very worst case scenario, which also means that your solar system and your battery system is gonna be oversized 95% of the time. You're only gonna need those extra batteries that, that extra size of the solar system for a short period of time every year. So that's why most people don't size solar systems and things like that. And, but we, we tend to think that way because we size our furnaces for the coldest day. You say, well, I gotta stay warm. I want my house 75 degrees when it's 10 below. Okay, well now you need 120,000 BTU on a furnace. But that doesn't make sense when you think about solar. You don't wanna size it to your worst case scenario because it's grossly oversized the vast majority of the time. Um, so you shoot for the middle, you shoot for the average. And uh, that's why it's hard to say on the battery thing for cars, since I need so much power to move them, you're powering. And if you don't charge the car, but once a week, you've got a lot of batteries that are being charged and sitting there doing very little for six days a week. So um, again, you're paying for something that's not being used all that often. If well, that, folks, uh, uh, that's clear. Thank, thank you very much for uh, showing up and uh, staying with us all this time. Yes, and, thank uh, you very much. We will... Uh, keep you apprised as to when our next workshop is going to be. Yes, and Bob will have this uh, presentation on the, the website. And I'll, I think he, I don't know if he comes in at the end to explain that, but there will be a recording for uh, this particular presentation uh, on the Climate Council um, YouTube homepage, not homepage, what is it, the YouTube um, it's failing. Climate Council's YouTube channel. So Climate yeah. GKC on YouTube, you'll find this video up there probably this weekend. Okay. Thank you, Bob. You'll I'll also find it, a link to it on the HRES website. Yeah, we tend to link to anything that we present. Also, we, a way to find the recordings through our website as well. So that, that that's one thing that the COVID crisis has done is it's uh, put a lot more stuff on the website. Sure has. And it's, Thanks, Bob. It's good in a way because it used to be you go to a presentation in per person and then you leave and then that's that. You think, oh, I would have liked to have had a record of that. But now you can, if our information is, is valuable enough, you can go back and watch it again or the pieces of it, what part you, you think what you want to get back to. So anyway, now I'm Bob hey, babbling. Bob, do you, uh, you want to say anything about the Climate Council of Greater Kansas City? Um, I really don't need to. It's been a great presentation. Thank you. Anybody wants to learn more about the Climate Council, go to climategkc.org. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And uh, we hope you have a, a very successful, sustainable future.